Well, good afternoon, everyone. Have you had a good day so far? How about the preacher this morning? I hear that he was on fire. <clears throat> the fire kept burning and burning and burning. Hallelujah. I like to sit and listen to CA. CA has a lot of good material, enthusiasm, very good friend. This afternoon we are going to begin in our study notes on page 343 and we're only going to look at that one page. Not for all two hours. <clears throat> but uh, those are the principles that are going to guide us in our study. You know, uh, the theology of Jonah begins on page 303 and goes all the way to page 369. There's no way that we can cover that material in two sessions. And so what I did was I uh, synthesized everything uh, and the additional material you'll have in your study notes so that when you go home uh, you can go through the study notes and get the additional material. What I'm going to cover particularly in, in the two classes this afternoon is the chapter uh, that is titled The Typology, Typology in Jonah. But in the study notes it's only seven pages but there's much more that I'm going to be sharing uh, here in the class. So um, basically we're starting on page 343, just studying that one page, the principles governing the use of typology, and uh, then uh, the other material uh, is in the study notes, but we're not going to follow the study notes the way we have before. So let's have a word of prayer and get into our study. Father in heaven, we thank you now that we're able to gather together after feeding our physical bodies with delicious food. We ask that the spiritual food will nourish us just as well as the physical food. And we thank you for the privilege of prayer. And we ask that you will help your word to cause the impact for which you sent it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Had a very good meeting in ASI today. We had a full house there on Crowley. It's not exactly in Keene, it's in Crowley, uh, in the gymnasium. Uh, the people were very attentive, and uh, it was a blessing being there. So I rushed there this morning, and then I rushed back. And fortunately, I was even able to get some lunch here. Uh, that's why we had kind of a, a delay, not because I was eating lunch, but because many of you were still eating lunch as well. <laughs> so uh, I figured that I might, I, I might as well just jump on the bandwagon. So anyway, um, let's go through these rules that govern the use of typology. Do you understand what I mean by typology? Let me give you just this very simple illustration. The lamb is the type, and Christ is the anti-type, okay? The word anti-type means that which takes the place of the type. So the type is the Old Testament uh, illustration, and the anti-type, that which takes the place of the type, is the fulfillment. Uh, so uh, that will give you an illustration of what type and anti-type are. Now let's go through these eight rules that we need to use to govern our interpretation of typology. First of all, a type is always thoroughly rooted in history. If the type did not occur in history, how is it possible to build a typology based on it? So in other words, the, the story of Jonah has to have happened his, historically in order to have a future fulfillment, right? Because the future fulfillment without the occurrence in history would make absolutely no sense because it would be imaginary. The second principle is that types are always prophetic. They always point forward to a greater fulfillment in the future. In other words, the type is like a model in miniature. The anti-type is much broader in its fulfillment. Number three, anti-types are definitely designed as an integral part of redemptive history. They are not afterthoughts invented by a later author. In other words, a later author doesn't come along and he say, okay, I'm, I'm going to build a type-anti-type relationship between what happened here in the, in the future and I'm going to invent some story in the past. It doesn't work that way. 
Number four, types are always centered in Christ. Number five, types are edificatory. edificatory. In other words, they have meaning for God's people in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. So they're edificatory. In other words, they edify. Um, number six, the anti-type is always greater and more perfect than the type. Without intending to be irreverent, the lamb represents Jesus, but Jesus is not a four-legged animal covered with wool. We must not force every single detail of the type upon the anti-type. Number seven, carefully consider the, consider the pattern and sequence of events in the type, that is in what occurred once before, and determine if the antitype contains the same pattern or sequence of events. And finally, we must guard against making wild connections between the type and the antitype. You know, there was, uh, there was a church father by the name of Origen. And in his interpretations, he was very original. He lived up to his name. He wildly made connections between Old Testament stories and New Testament fulfillments that the authors never intended. So we not, need to make sure that we're not involved in allegory, you know, just uh, making imaginary connections between uh, the type and the anti-type. So those are the principles that are going to guide us in our study uh, in this session and in the next session as well. The book of Jonah is an unusual book in the Old Testament because it does not seem to have a message for Israel. Rather, it seems to be the story of a rebellious prophet who was sent with a message to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. However, although the book does not seem to address the people of Israel like the other prophets, a careful scrutiny of the book indicates that it most certainly does have a message for Israel. The key to understanding this book is that Jonah personifies the condition of Israel in his day. In other words, Jonah in himself has the same attitude as Israel in his day. The name Jonah means dove. And the Old Testament describes Israel as God's dove. So his name is Dove, and his experience is an illustration of on a broader scale, what occurred with Israel. Let's notice a couple of texts that identify Israel as God's dove. Hosea 11 verse 11 says, They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. This is the return from the captivity. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. So notice that the dove is going to come out of captivity in Egypt, and is going to come out of captivity into Assyria. Also, Psalm 74 and verse 19, here we find the psalmist uh, crying out to God, Oh, do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Once again, it's an Israelite crying out and referring to Israel, in this case, as God's turtle dove. In our study today, we are going to see that chapters 1 and 4 draw a typological relationship between the attitude of Israel in the days of Jonah and the attitude of Israel in the days of Jesus Christ. Chapters 2 and 3 draw a typological relationship between the experience of Jonah and the experience of Jesus. So 1 and 4, the experience of Jonah and Israel, and the experience of Israel in the days of Christ. Chapters 2 and 3, the relationship, the typological relationship between Jonah and Christ. First, let's read Christ's interpretation. Well, we're not going to do this till later on. Let's go to chapter 1 chapter 1 of Jonah. We're going to look at the type first, 
And then we're going to go to the anti-type. God chose Israel above all nations for two specific reasons. Number one, to safeguard the truth. And number two, to proclaim the truth to the world to prepare it for the coming, for the first coming of the Messiah. So Israel was chosen, chosen functionally, not irrevocably, not, oh Israel, I'm going to choose Israel and nothing can change anything. No. Israel was chosen to fulfill two specific purposes. Safeguard the truth that are found mainly in the scriptures of the Old Testament, and secondly, to proclaim those truths to the surrounding nations. Let's read several texts that indicate this specific point. Exodus chapter 19, and we want to begin with, I believe it's verse 3. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. So notice, God says to Moses, come up to the mountain, because I have a message for you to deliver to Israel. And then God underlines how he intervened to deliver Israel from bondage, how he blessed Israel. He says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, I delivered you from a dictator, Pharaoh, and I have drawn you to myself. So that's the message that God is going, is going to have Moses give to Israel. And then God continues, now, therefore, if, so is this promise that we're going to read conditional? Yes. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, if then, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. So was there a condition for Israel to be above all nations in the plan of God? Yes. So once again, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses takes the message and he delivers the message to the people. Notice how it continues. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people, those are the representatives of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. God wants to make a covenant with us. And he says that if we obey his voice and keep his covenant, we're going to be a special treasure and we're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do you accept or not? And notice the response. Once again, in verse 7, verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Did they accept the terms of the covenant, yes or no? Yes. And then Moses takes their promise back to God. So it says, continues saying, So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So this is the covenant. Before this, God made this covenant with individuals, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. But now he's forming a covenant with the nation. Are you following me or not? Did Israel accept the terms of the covenant? Yes. What would happen if they broke the terms of the covenant? Well, the covenant would be dissolved. By the way, the, the covenant that God made at Sinai was a marriage covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 32 says, I was a husband to them. So it was a marriage covenant. Uh, by the way, what did Israel do? Oh, she had lots of outside lovers. So the prophets are God's lawyers in divorce court. But God bears long with Israel. What I want you to see here is that God made a covenant with Israel. He said, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now what does that mean? priests, holy nation. 
The answer is in the New Testament where this passage is quoted partially. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. Here Peter is going to repeat some of the elements that we found in Exodus 19. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Is that referring back to Exodus 19, yes or no? Absolutely. His own special people, is that back there? Yes it is. Now why? Why are these words used, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, what is the next word? That. In other words, you were chosen for this that he's going to mention now. That you may what? Proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What was Israel supposed to do as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a special people? They were to shut themselves in within themselves and not reach out to anyone. No, the purpose was that they proclaim the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, like Israel at, was not a people, but are now the people of God, which happened at Sinai, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So God promised to bless Israel, and he wanted Israel to proclaim his message to the world. Now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. This is a verse that mentions Jonah. You see, Jonah arose in the period when Jeroboam was king. And during the period of Jeroboam, the kingdom grew all the way to the borders that had existed in the days of Solomon. So God had, had greatly blessed them at this time. So notice what it says in 2 Kings 14 verse 25. He, that is Jeroboam, restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. So what had Jonah prophesied? He had prophesied that Jeroboam was going to extend the borders of Israel basically to the borders that had existed in the days of Solomon. God had promised to bless Israel and to expand their borders. And Jonah was the instrument that God used to explain that Israel was going to prosper and was going to expand. But Israel came to believe that God's promises were divine rights without the corresponding responsibilities. This brought about a spirit of nationalism and exclusivism. Jonah wondered how God could prosper Israel and place her at the pinnacle of all nations if he favored the hated Assyrians who at that time were in the ascendancy. So Jonah has conflictive thoughts. He says, God has said that he's going to bless us. He's going to place us above all other nations. He's going to expand our borders. And so that can't mean that Assyria is going to grow and is going to be a powerful nation. They refuse to recognize that God claimed all nations as his, including Egypt and Assyria. Notice Isaiah 19 verses 24 and 25. Isaiah 19, 24 and 29. In that day Israel be, will be one of three. One of what? Three. With Egypt and Assyria. Have mercy. Egypt had enslaved Israel. Assyria was going to enslave Israel. 
And God says, in that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So God says, no, it's not only Israel. Egypt is mine, Assyria is mine, all nations are mine, and I want all nations to come to a knowledge of the truth in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. Let's go to Genesis 12, 1 to 3 to see what God's plan was for Israel. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. This is when God called Abraham to leave his land and go to the promised land. Now the Lord said, had said to Abram, get out of your country. By the way, do you know where Abraham lived? In the region of Assyria and Babylon, because Assyria and Babylon cover basically the same territory. So basically God has called Abraham out of Babylon. Interesting. Do you know why he called him out of Babylon? Joshua 24 says because Abraham's family was falling into idolatry. So God said, leave your family and go to the promised land. So God says, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great what? A great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the Jews of the earth shall be blessed. For whom was the blessing of Abraham? For all nations, including the Gentiles. And how were the Gentiles to know that? God chose Israel to let them know that. He didn't choose them to put them at the pinnacle of civilization and then enclose themselves as an exclusive property of God. So it says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. By the way, we read the other day that that blessing came through whom? Through Jesus Christ. Let's read once again Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14. The blessing was not going to come through Abraham. It would only come through Abraham because Christ came from Abraham. The blessing would come from Abraham through Jesus Christ to everyone. It says in chapter 3 and verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And now notice verse 14. Verse 14 says that, in other words, Christ took the curse so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Jews. No, upon whom? The Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. God loved Israel and the Gentiles, but he chose Israel to reach the Gentiles. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I believe it's verses 4 and 5. Therefore God says to Israel, be careful to observe them. In other words, my commandments and my laws and my statutes. Be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. So what was going to be uh, that, would, that which would attract the attention of the nations? God's commandments being observed by Israel. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, what would be the reaction of the people, of the nations that surrounded Israel? Surely this Great nation is a wise and understanding people. Let's read also Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. Isaiah 49 and verse 6. This is a very interesting verse. 
it tells us that God raised Israel not only to raise Israel but to raise the Gentiles. It says he's giving this message to Israel. Indeed he says it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Yes, I chose you to raise up the, the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. But now notice, I will also give you as a light to the what? To the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the Holy Land. No, to the end of the what? To the end of the earth. Are you catching the picture? Notice Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. God is speaking to Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And now notice what it says. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Are you catching in these verses why God chose Israel? He chose Israel functionally. And you know what? God has chosen the Seventh-day Adventist church functioning, functionally as well. This church was chosen for one reason, and that is to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. That is the reason for our existence, is to proclaim the message of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. The organization has the purpose of making it possible to reach the whole world. You see, without an organization that is found in every place of the world, it's difficult to reach the whole world. The organization of the Adventist church is functional. In other words, it's not an end in itself to preserve the organization. The purpose of the organization is to plant believers all over the world. Because you have a witness all over the world. Just like happened with Israel, only in the Old Testament the nations would come to Israel, whereas today we are to go and teach all nations. Notice Zechariah chapter 8, 20 to 23. This is one of my favorite texts that speaks about God's purpose for Israel. Zechariah 8 verse 20 to verse 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. And then the other person responds, I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Wow! They were to come to Israel and say, what is the secret of your success? And Israel would say, we serve the living God. We serve Yahweh. We serve Jehovah. But unfortunately, Israel fell into formalism and ritualism. The ritual, their beliefs became an end in themselves, and they enclosed themselves within themselves. Notice how Isaiah expressed this. By the way, Isaiah and Jonah are from the same period. Notice Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 to 15, how Israel had fallen into ritualism and formalism. They made the religion an end in itself. It says there in Isaiah 1 and verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? 
Bring no, no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Wow. That's the condition of Israel in the days of Isaiah. Jesus quoted a very interesting text in Isaiah. Isaiah 29 verse 13. He said, this people serves me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. By the way, Jesus also quoted Hosea, who was a contemporary of Isaiah and Jonah. And the words that Jesus quoted were, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Who had commanded all these observances? God. Had God commanded burnt offerings, sacrifices, burning incense, new moons, assemblies, feasts? Had God commanded these? Yes, but they were functional. The purpose was to show in these things the Messiah, but they made these things an end in themselves, and they enclosed themselves, and they did not share the message with other nations. And so God tells Jonah, who had predicted the prosperity of Israel, that it was going to expand its borders, he tells Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1 verse 2, three imperatives, arise, go to Nineveh. What nation was Nineveh the capital of? Assyria, that was in the ascendancy at that time. They were growing in power. So God says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. How does Jonah respond? Remember Jonah personifies the attitude of Israel. Verse 3, but Jonah arose to flee from Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went, notice that this is really a downward direction when you go away from the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it, and eventually he ends up down in the belly of the fish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah went exactly in the opposite direction of where God commanded him to go. He was supposed to go north and east to Assyria. He went south and west to Tarshish which is in Spain which was the outer limits of the civilization at that time. The furthest reach from the hand of the Lord. He fled from his mission because he did not want to preach God's love to the Gentiles because he had predicted that Israel would be at the top. And you say, how do you know that? Well, let's go to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2 and see why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. By the way, there probably were several reasons. He probably thought, you know, the, the Assyrians are very cruel people. Some kings, kings would tear out the tongues and, uh, and the lips of their enemies. Another king would place the skulls of his enemies in front of a palace. They were violent. The Assyrians committed genocide on a regular basis. They eliminated entire nations. So maybe Jonah thought, hmm, you know, one Israelite going to Nineveh and, pre Nineveh and preaching such a, such a short sermon, in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. <laughs> Are they going to listen to me? But that's not the main reason. The main reason is that he feared that the Assyrians would be converted and God would favor them. Notice chapter 4 and verse 2. 
So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. <laughs> I knew that you would favor the Assyrians, but how can Israel prosper if God blesses the Assyrians? That's what he is thinking. Now as you read the book of Jonah, you'll find that the book presents the Gentiles in a very positive light. While it presents Jonah, who represents Israel, in a very negative light. While the Gentiles in the ship are perishing, Jonah flees and sleeps. Likewise, Israel was sleeping and fleeing from her mission to the surrounding nations. The Gentiles could not distinguish between their right hand and their left hand. They did not know the difference between right and wrong. This means that they had no moral compass. And, fa and Jonah failed to share the message with them. Israel had the law, the covenants, the sanctuary, the message that the Ninevites needed to hear. Assyria needed the message of the Lord. Ironically, the sea obeyed the Lord. The wind obeyed the Lord. And the fish obeyed the Lord. But Jonah did not. So Jonah was more ignorant than a fish. Isaiah, a contemporary of Jonah, thus wrote these words about his people, about God's people. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know my people do not consider. So Israel had fallen below the level of beasts. They did not know who their owner was. They did not know who had liberated them from bondage. In the book of Jonah, like I mentioned, the prophet is portrayed in a very negative light. In chapters 1 and 4, the pagan Gentile sailors and the Ninevites are presented in a very positive light. The pagans were more in tune with God than Jonah. And the same could be said about Israel. Instead of witnessing to the pagan sailors, Jonah put them in danger. While they struggled with the storm and cried out to their gods, Jonah was sound asleep. And so was the condition of Israel. God was even merciful toward the animals in Nineveh. They were not destroyed either, according to the story. The Gentile sailors, when finally Jonah woke up, the sailors say, hey, you know, cry out to your God, pray to your God. The Gentile sailors now begged Jonah to testify to them about his God. They said, tell us about your God, your people, and your country. They truly feared God, and they treated the prophet better than he deserved. They did everything possible to take the ship to land. And when Jonah said, throw me in, they said, we can't throw you in. What are you talking about? They were more merciful than Jonah was, like Israel at the same time. And they only threw him in at last when he said, well, you know, only if you throw me in will the storm abate because God is punishing me. So the prophet, instead of witnessing about God, he puts the Gentiles in danger. Notice Jonah chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9. They, the sailors say, witness to us, Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Should he have done this when he entered the boat? Of course. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? 
what is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. Yeah, ju yeah, right. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Notice verses 10 through 16, the they, sailors do everything possible to not throw Jonah overboard. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, notice what the men do. Nevertheless, they rode hard to return to land. But they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried, notice the prayer that they're going to raise to the Lord, these Gentiles. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. Innocent, yeah, right. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And now notice this. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Are the Gentiles placed in a very positive light? They most certainly are. Is Jonah placed, placed in a very negative light? Yes, because Jonah represented the attitude of Israel in that day. He personifies Israel. So now we go to chapter 2. In chapter 2 of Jonah, a fish swallows the prophet. And the, the interesting point is that there is much death language in this chapter. Jonah felt separated from God, yet harbored hope of still beholding God in his holy temple. In three days and three nights, Jonah died, was buried, and resurrected, so to speak. And as God commanded the fish to vomit Jonah, we're going to see God the Father commanded the tomb to vomit Jesus. At his dying breath, Jesus had said to his father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I want to share with you the death language that we find in Jonah chapter 2. In verse 1, Jonah cries out to the Lord. By the way, Jonah cried out to the Lord while he was still alive, correct? So let me ask you, is, the, is Jonah in the belly of the fish part of the three days and three nights? Yes or no? Of course. So there's a period in which he's alive, and that's part of the three days and three nights, right? So he cries out, as soon as he's swallowed by the fish, while he's still alive from the belly of the fish. Now, if you notice chapter 2, and you have this in your study notes, by the way, Jonah went to Sheol. That's verse 2. You know what Sheol is? It's the grave. He went to the grave, according to verse 2. He also went to the deep. The Hebrew word is mesulah. And Psalm 69 verse 15 has three synonymous words to describe where Jonah went. The three synonymous words are, let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Incidentally, that same word, mesula, that is used for flood water in this verse is used in Job 14.31 to describe the abode of Leviathan. And Leviathan is a symbol of whom? He's a symbol of Satan. Also in verse 3 we find that Job went to the heart of the seas. Interesting. 
the word heart because later on we're going to find that Jesus went to the heart of the earth. Jonah felt that he was cast out from God's sight. You can read that in verse 4. In fact, Jonah had ambivalent feelings. He says, I have been cast out from your sight, but then he says, and yet I know that I'm going to see your holy temple. Did Jesus have the same type of ambivalent feelings in his life? He says, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Also, we notice in this passage, in verse 5, that Jonah goes to the deep. The word deep is tehom. The same word that is used in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Where the, spirit, where the spirit moved over the face of the what? Over the face of the deep. Also in verse 6 it says that prison bars enclosed Jonah. I read uh, from, Psalm, from the Psalms. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. This is actually Jonah in his book. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. But then he says, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. And then verse 7 uses the words pit and grave also. All of this, the common denominator of all of these things, is that Jonah went to the grave. These are different ways of expressing the realm where the dead go. So in other words, Jonah, at least at, at the first he's crying out to God, but in the type he dies and he is buried in the belly of the fish. But then what happens on the third day? On the third day he resurrects from the dead. Because the fish vomits him onto the dry earth. That is chapter 2. Now let's go to chapter 3. Jonah, who has died, been buried, and resurrected, so to speak, now fulfills his mission with the power of the Holy Spirit. No fancy venue. No colorful handbills, no sound system, no special music, no gifts, no projectors, no screens, and a very short and to the point message that could be proclaimed in less than a minute. The result of a three day crusade was nothing short of miraculous. <laughs> what evangelist? would not be happy if in an evangelistic campaign 120,000 people were baptized. <laughs> I'll tell you, that person would end up at the general conference, working in the general conference. Because they would say, you know, <laughs> this individual is a very successful evangelist. Notice the reaction of the Ninevites. Chapter 3 and verse 5. So the people of Nineveh Believe God. Proclaimed a fast. These are Gentiles. And put on sackcloth. From the greatest to the least of them. Did they truly believe God? Yes. yes. And they proclaim a fast. And they dress in sackcloth. Which is a sign of affliction. They repented. Notice verse 6. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Even the king is converted. By the way, these people were not only converted by the preaching of, no, of, Mo, of uh, no, Jonah, but they were converted by the sign of Jonah. Do you know what the sign of Jonah? These people had heard about what happened to Jonah. They knew the story of the sailors. Undoubtedly the sailors had, had shared this news. That this man had been swallowed by a fish. And he had survived for three days. And he has resurrected on the third day. 
We'll come to that later. By the way, they were so truly converted because their behavior changed. Notice verses 8 through 10. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will relent? will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. So the question is, how could one man with a redundant short sermon in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, bring about such a miraculous conversion. Could not the king have had him arrested and thrown into prison or probably killed? The answer is that they were converted because they believed in the sign of Jonah. We'll notice in the New Testament that the Gentiles believed because of the sign of Jesus. What was the sign? As we shall see, Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites because they had heard that Jonah had been thrown into the sea and a fish had swallowed him. For them he was as good as dead. And then he showed up preaching in Nineveh. They were converted by the sign of Jonah. They knew that he had died, been buried, and resurrected. And his preaching as a result brought conviction. Are you following me? This is a type. And then we have the anti-type, which is similar to the type. Now let's go quickly to chapter 4. Jonah personifies the attitude of Israel once again in chapter 4. So to speak, Jonah died, was buried and resurrected, and when the Ninevites saw the one sign, they believed his message. And 120,000 Gentiles were converted. But now notice, God had given Israel many signs in the days of Christ. And the adulterous generation of Jews refused to be converted. God dealt with the plant. What did God do with the plant? It existed one day, and what did it do? God destroyed the plant after one day. So God dealt with the plant as Jonah wanted God to deal with Nineveh. Jonah was furious that God would destroy a plant, but joyful if God destroyed the Gentiles. Are you with me? So Jonah was angry because God destroyed one gourd. But he would be happy if God destroyed 120,000 people. A gourd does not know the difference between right and wrong. The Ninevites did not know the difference between their right and left hand. Jonah did not create the gourd, but God had created the Ninevites. God destroyed the gourd in one day, but he made the Gentiles for eternity. The book of Jonah ends in suspense with a question. God asked him, do you have a reason to be angry? We do not know how the prophet responded to God's reasoning because the story was still being written. In this sense, it is similar to the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son does not tell you whether the reasoning of the father sunk into his older son. Let's read. Luke 15, 31 and 32. And remember, Jonah is a, is a representation of what? Of the attitude of Israel. This is when the son has returned home, all smelly. You know, he'd been with the swine. And the older brother says he was angry. Well, kind of like Jonah. He was angry and would not go in to the party that was taking place. 
Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, he doesn't say my brother, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harvests, you har harlots, he, you killed the padded calf, fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, like Israel was with God. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. The story ends without telling us what the older son did. The older son represents the Jews of Christ's day who had enclosed themselves within themselves, did not witness to the Gentiles because they felt that they were holier than thou. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 209, by the elder son were represented the unrepenting Jews of Christ's day, and also the Pharisees in every age who look with contempt upon those whom they regard as publicans and sinners. You know, the same thing is true of the story of the, uh, of the uh, parable of the fig tree. You know, Israel is represented by the fig tree. And, you know, six months before Jesus uh, began his ministry, John the Baptist began his ministry to announce that the Messiah was going to come. Two and a half years later, there's a parable of Luke chapter 13 where the owner of the vineyard says, I'm going to cut down this fig tree because this fig tree doesn't produce any fruit. And the vine dresser, who is Jesus, says, well, let's, let's leave it for another year. Jesus' ministry was going to last another year. And let's see if it produces fruit. If it produces fruit, we'll leave it. At the end of his ministry, Jesus sees a fig tree in the distance, the same fig tree of the parable. And he says to his disciples, let's go see if there's fruit on that. By the way, the fruit is proclaiming the message to the world and winning souls. And they go, and there wasn't a single fig on the tree. And the fig tree representing Israel was what? Was cursed. Never will you ever produce fruit again. That sounds pretty final, doesn't it? And so in our second session, we will deal with the fulfillment. <laughs>